So a patient was coming into the operating room recently and we were doing our surgical timeout, kind of like what you see up here. And we mentioned the fire risk score. The patient heard fire risk and they freaked out. I don't blame them when you're on the table here with all the uncertainties of surgery going on and suddenly you hear that there might be a fire going on in your body under anesthesia. Well, unfortunately, fires are a real risk in the operating room during surgery. They can happen in your body, they can happen in your mouth, in your breathing tube, and I'll share with you what we do to help reduce the risk and what you can do to also help reduce the risk. I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist, and I believe it's very important for patients to know what is going to happen to their body when they're having surgery. Because when you're more certain about what's going to happen to your body, the better you can prepare. And preparing for surgery is just as important as preparing to give a speech or preparing for an athletics event. And you can likely improve the chance of your surgery being successful with that preparation. Medicine's greatest secret is our inner healing potential. And it's most powerful under anesthesia. When we let go of the reality, we think we know. Fire risks are fortunately not a big deal nowadays, but they used to be a real serious risk. To understand why the fires happened, you have to go back to prehistoric anesthesia. I have a video discussing opium, marijuana, mandrake root, and alcohol. Back then, we didn't really have solid anesthesia, and it was mostly stuff that you would eat. So there wasn't that much of a fire risk from those alone. We also had hypnosis and acupuncture before modern anesthesia, and those also didn't have much of a fire risk. However, in the 1700s, when laughing gas was discovered, suddenly we had a gas that you would inhale. In fact, we still use it today. It's this blue N2O that you see here. We spin it to help release gas out of the ventilator. Nitrous oxide, or N2O, or laughing gas, can support combustion. It's not very common at the concentrations we use, but it is possible. However, in 1846, when diethyl ether, or more commonly called ether, was discovered to be a potent general anesthetic, meaning that you would inhale it and it would make you unconscious and you wouldn't remember what happened to your body. It sounded like a panacea for surgery and anesthesia. However, Ether-based anesthetics are flammable and you're inhaling them. And there are sources of ignition in surgery. So this was the era of explosions when we had flammable anesthetics. To understand why things blow up, you have to remember that there are three parts to supporting combustion. The first is a source of energy. That can be electrocautery, like what we use to cauterize blood vessels or lasers like what's used in ENT surgeries for vocal cord polyps or other abnormalities, or quite frankly, anything that has an ignition source or a spark. You then need to have an oxidizing agent. So something like oxygen or something like ether or even laughing gas, like what comes out of that ventilator back there. There are many sources of combustion in the operating room. Unfortunately, human tissue is one of them because human tissue and flesh can burn, but you also have things within your body like this breathing tube, which can also burn. So for example, in an ENT surgery, if you have this tube down your mouth and there's a laser being used and there is a combustible gas there, maybe high concentrations of oxygen, like you see here, an oxidizing agent, or in the past when ether or other flammable anesthetics were used, that could be a source of a fire in the airway. Fires can happen in other parts of your body as well. In the past, laparoscopies were sometimes used with flammable gases. Laparoscopy is when they inflate your belly with a gas so they can do camera-based procedures without having to cut you open all the way, just make little holes and put cameras in them to do the surgery minimally invasively. It works very well when done safely. Nowadays, we use carbon dioxide to insufflate or inflate the abdominal cavity, but in the past, if there were combustible gases used with electrocautery, that could, and sometimes did, cause an explosion within the patient. There are actually other sources of combustible gases. I mentioned the laughing gas that comes out of the ventilator behind me, but the bacteria in your intestines can also produce methane and hydrogen, 
which are combustible. Now, fortunately, we ask patients not to eat for eight to 12 hours before surgery. Every institution is different, but that helps reduce the amount of food that's being munched on by those bacteria, which also helps reduce the amount of gas that they're producing. Realistically, it's a very low concern in modern day anesthesia. We also reduce the concentrations of oxidizing agents, in particular, oxygen. So when you are having those ENT surgeries in your mouth with lasers being used by the ENT surgeon, your anesthesiologist is always lowering the oxygen level to the safest tolerated amount. The healthier your lungs are to tolerate those lower levels of oxygen, the less likely it is to have a fire. In fact, some surgeries can be done with you inhaling normal air. Remember that air only has 21% oxygen, and that's the yellow knob you see here on the ventilator. We try to use as much air as possible during surgeries versus oxygen or nitrous oxide during ENT surgeries or other surgeries where there is a high fire risk score. Another thing that's helped make surgery safer to reduce the risk of fires and explosions is modern anesthetic agents. Ether and other flammable anesthetics fell out of favor once we discovered less flammable anesthetics, notably halothane. We added halogen agents to these original anesthetic prototypes because halogens presumably made these anesthetic gases less flammable. Halothane was one of the first less flammable anesthetics. We've since replaced halothane because it had a kind of unfavorable side effect profile with what we call halogenated ethers or anesthetics like sevoflurane. They have halogens on them, in particular fluorine, to help minimize their flammability and in the concentrations that we use when you're asleep, they're much safer than ether and the original flammable anesthetics. On top of that, we have IV anesthetics like propofol that avoid the problem altogether because propofol ain't gonna be blowing up in your IV if this is what's keeping you asleep. And we mix propofol with medications like fentanyl and other IV anesthetics, ketamine, etomidate, et cetera, which don't pose that same fire risk score. One cool thing I wanna show you is that with these ventilators, when you change the nitrous oxide, notice that the oxygen is also changing. So when I move this up, this also turns. And that's a mechanical safeguard to prevent giving the patient a hypoxic oxygen mixture. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments about that. And lastly, another source of fires isn't from the anesthesia at all. It's from alcohol-based cleaning solutions that go on your skin. Because when we clean off your skin on this bed here and we cover it up with the blue drapes, the alcohol that's evaporating might get stuck under those drapes. And as you probably know, alcohol is highly flammable. And in the presence of a spark or any other ignition source, you can have a kaboom under the drapes. It would be outside of your body, somewhere like on your skin, it can still be lethal. But what happens if the fire is in your breathing tube that's in the back of your mouth? Fortunately, your anesthesiologists have trained for this experience for years. Even though it's very rare, we always do the same thing. The first thing you do is you immediately turn off the oxygen source. So you turn this off, you turn the ventilator off, it makes that very satisfying snapping sound. And simultaneously, with all of those gases off, you pull that breathing tube out of the patient's mouth. It's important to turn off the ventilator because if you have those gases blowing oxygen-rich gas out of this breathing tube and near the fire, you can imagine a blowtorch, literally, as this PVC tube is on a fire and oxygen is just blowing out of it. So you have to turn these off in conjunction. You then have to douse the burned area with saline to put out any existing flames. And then you need to remove any debris that might be in the airway, like pieces of that plastic tube that I showed you. And lastly, you need to immediately restore the airway for the patient because they're asleep under anesthesia. They may not be breathing on their own. You might try to do that with the oxygen mask, but whatever you do, whether it's with an LMA, with an endotracheal tube, you have to restore the airway before that swelling occurs from the burned tissue. While this all may sound very scary, have confidence that your anesthesiologist has been practicing this for years and knows what to do in those rare scenarios. 
and be sure to not cheat with the fasting, so don't eat food before your surgery. And the healthier your lungs are, the better you can tolerate lower oxygen concentrations to help make surgery, especially ENT surgery, even safer.